Welcome to Clockworks, a Legion podcast. I'm Paul Moffat. I'm Jan Moffat. Or should I say we're Professor Moffat and the X-Jan? What? <laughs> like, because I'm actually Professor and then X-Jan, like X-Man. And then it's like Professor X and the X-Men. Yeah. Because we're, we're talking about like a Legion comic and there's X-Men in it. Right, right. You get, you get it. close. <laughs> if my name was Jen, it might work. You're an X Jan. They call them X Man, even if they're not Mans. Uh huh. <laughs> We're talking today about the fourth volume of the X Men Legacy Legion series. This volume is called "We For We Are Many." I think I. It took me a while to figure out the naming convention. Naming conventions in comics are not totally easy to get, even when you read comics a lot. Yep. So, like, I think I called the last one Prodigal, but it wasn't Prodigal. Only first volume was called Prodigal. Right. And yes. this volume is called For We Are Many. Yeah. That's the name of the whole volume. And then each issue has its own name also. Yeah. Yeah. That like, makes that sense. Makes a lot of sense. It just I wasn't quite... I was slow <laughs> figuring oh, that. I already knew all that. I just didn't realize you didn't. Okay. <laughs> this this uh, volume comprises of issues 19 to 25. You can find this volume digitally at the Marvel store or by Googling it. We'll have links to that in the show notes. We got it through the Marvel store, but we also got some of the issues in paper copy from our friendly neighborhood comic book store. And you probably can do that too. Issue 19. The cover is David with uh, Abigail Brand of Sword, uh, the green space police, uh, standing behind him. He's holding a wanted poster featuring the golden Professor X who escaped from his mind last issue. The relevance of this uh, cover is pretty straightforward. David is searching for that golden X criminal. Every issue in this volume, like every issue in every volume, is written by Simon Spurrier. All the covers are by Mike Del Mundo. I'm not going to give those credits again, but the art changes issue to issue a little bit among the rotating uh, roster of artists. So this issue is Pencils by Tan Ang Huat and Ink by Craig Young. Do you want to take us through the summary? Do I say that, or do you just do it? Doesn't matter. So this is issue 19, and its title is either Smoke Mirror or Mirror Smoke. We're having a disagreement about this, and perhaps we will post a picture of the cover page, or the title page, because it's the word smoke with the word mirror interspersed between the letters. I think it's got to be smoke mirror, because, like, smoke and mirrors is a saying. But I thought it was, like... Mirror smoke, like when you have smoke on your mirror. Then you, then mirror is the adjective? Yes. Because smoke mirror doesn't really make sense, exactly, I guess. Exactly, but mirror smoke kind of does. Anyway, <laughs> all that irrelevant detail aside, David is being held by S.W.O.R.D. S -W -O -R -D, and Arcus, who works for S.W.O.R.D., I guess. because With of... S.W.O.R.D. on this occasion? Yes. Because of the shadow creature who escaped his mind and is causing chaos on Earth, Arcus plans to use a weapon, the Shadow Phoenix, on David. And that's right. issue 19. I, first of all, this page, the first page of this issue, no, not the first page, it starts with Ruth having uh, fever dreams, which she kind of does for a couple of issues. Yeah. But when we get to the real story... <laughs> Uh, one of the first things that happens is the little ball has returned. The orb that shouts space justice. Space justice! I love it! <laughs> it's great. And it continues to be great. It adds to its phrases, space justice! Justice for space crimes! Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we also get the return of Sid the Useless Psychic. Yes, who's hilarious in this issue as well. The sword in general is nice, like, I feel like there's a couple of elements of sword that work quite well and continue to. 
And they help. They have a bit of comic relief. Yeah. From all this intensity. So we also we have the return of Arcus. I kind of like the return of Arcus also. Yeah, he's the guy who David uh, kind of pre-crimed. Yes. <laughs> he figured out he was going to commit a crime and punished him ahead of time. So Arcus isn't really happy about that, is he? No, well, like, he seems not to be in this issue. In this issue. <laughs> he, there's a couple of pages in this issue. One of Arcus's face with his memories and one with David's face with his memories that are just gorgeous art. Yeah. It's a fantastic job. And it's like a spread, right? Yeah, one on the left and page. one on the right, full page. Yeah. I agree. Those are really good in design and execution. Yeah. They look great. I'm glad Arcus is back. I feel like it's nice to bring loose threads back in, even if it's not necessarily in... Yeah, I said that already. Um, I hate, though, that we don't get answers about what the Golden X guy is. That it gets, like, built up as if Arcus has the answers and then, like, oh, he doesn't have answers. It gets pulled, the rug pulled under us and, like, that's a bait and switch that's supposed to be funny but isn't. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like, don't act like you are going to give us the answers to a big mystery and then not. It's just unsatisfying. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Did you expect the return of Arcus? Because I didn't really... I guess I didn't know he was a, a an X-Men villain beforehand. He's not an X-Men villain. Oh, not X-Men, sorry, he wasn't a, a hero or something. Yeah. An existing character is what I mean. Yeah, I didn't expect the return of him. That's one of the reasons I liked it. Because yeah. I thought, like, the things that David has done in the past aren't just throwaway. Mm-hmm. They continue to have consequences. Yeah, it's absolutely. like both in plot terms and also in symbolic terms to have something that he's done in the past come back and make a difference to what's happening now. Yeah. I think is well done. Yeah. This volume in general has, I mean, to be continued at the end of every issue. And I feel like every issue is very bombastic. And especially this one of like, meet the Shadow Phoenix! Bum, 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 bum. Bum. The Shadow and Phoenix, like, by the way. So like, some kind of, you're telling me it's some kind of a dark phoenix? <laughs> Except Wait. that dark phoenix already exists. I know! Phoenix. That's why, like, what? what? It's like an extra dark. You've heard it's of d- the dark phoenix, here's like the shadow of that dark it's, phoenix. It's, it doesn't really make a lot of no, sense. No, it sure doesn't. It sure um, doesn't. I really like in this issue, though, the concept of uh, Golden X. I'm going to just call him Golden X. Is that his name? Well, in, to, to me from okay, now on. Okay, so Professor X, shadow creature. Okay, so we've, I've he's called like the evil shade of Professor X and things like that. So Golden X is a good name to call him. That's That works well because I haven't really been knowing. Like, I don't want to call him Professor X when that's not who he is. And we, there was some question earlier, but now for sure he's definitely not. And frankly, we never thought he was Professor X. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, I really like that Golden X's villainy is just like, he just wants to make people mean. Right? Yeah. I quite like that as a villain's MO. He's he's just making people mean. They're like, there's something appealing about pettiness in a villain. Yep, absolutely. Appealing in like it makes them really villainous, you know? Yep. Also, in this issue, Arcus's little speech about an egg... That really reminded me of season two of Legion and how we keep talking about an idea as an egg. Oh, yeah. And he has, like, how exactly does he put it here at the end of this issue is, like, uh, an egg. A bird has a nest and it has an egg and this egg uh, is what it lays and it's, you know, all about potential. I can't... Anyway, it doesn't matter how he puts it, but the fixation on an egg comes up in Legion Season 2. Absolutely. Huh. I didn't even think of that. That's interesting. And what is birthed from this egg looks not unlike the weird oily creature. I know. 
So issue 20. Do you want to talk about the cover? Yeah. The cover is like an instructional manual for Legion Beast Mode. And it's like a, it looks like a toy instruction manual where all the David's alternate personalities are like snap-on accessories on building up this Voltron style Beast Mode. I really, really like it. It's one of my favorite covers. Yeah, me too. It's really clever. It's very cool looking. Very clever. I really like the covers that Mike Del Mondo does sometimes where, like, it doesn't look like a comic book cover. Yeah. And he's done a few of those. And this is one of them. And it is great. The significance uh, in this issue, David starts to learn to integrate his personalities. Yes. And then we're seeing that on the cover. Mm Mm-hmm. This issue has uh, pencils by Tan Eng Huat and inks by Craig Young and Ed Tadeo. In this issue, which is called The Epitaph, David battles with the Shadow Phoenix and begins to merge his identities together. As he does, Arcus reveals that the Shadow Phoenix was all a ploy. I like the concept of... In this issue of David finding unity and cohesion within himself, like, mm-hmm. I think that's a really good... And it's through this whole volume, right? Yeah. That's a really good idea, I think, to end Legion on. But it doesn't entirely make sense as it as they play it out, right? Yeah, exactly. Even in this issue. Because, like, all these personalities are are were introduced to us as horrible villains and so merging with them it's a bad idea and doesn't that seem like a bad idea right an idea that begins as an egg <laughs> exactly <laughs> i mean yes and no is like is the ultimate goal for David to keep his mind a cortex and have everybody in their own separate cells, or does he need to be a whole person? I think he re- I think he needs to be a whole person, and I like that. But it doesn't entirely make sense with what we've been told so far. Yeah, yeah. you know that's not you're not wrong. Like I think it's a more desirable outcome, but it's hard to square that with what we've already seen so far. And the last couple of issues, we've been kind of downplaying that these are personalities. Uh, Remember the very first issue when they have like fully fleshed personalities and now they're like basically just um, manifestations of powers. Yeah, that's true. Because we were driving towards this where he integrates them all and that's a good thing and it should be a good thing. But like, there's also a sense that maybe we'll come up uh, later in this volume, but why not just talk about it now? That, like, in this whole volume, David fixes his multiple personalities by just deciding he wants to. Mm -hmm. And that, like, it's a supernatural mutant mental illness, but, like, what it says about mental illness is, like, you can just decide not to be mentally ill anymore. But, right? it doesn't, but it doesn't work. But it doesn't work. He's not really, really unsuccessful. That's very true. By doing that and can't actually do that. That is what turns him into all sorts of horrors is trying to merge all of his personalities. We'll come back to this again yeah, later. In a no. later issue, it is much more explicit all about that stuff. Yeah. Um. Speaking of Legion, the TV show, the moment where he comes kind of out back out of his mind and he's floating he's destroying things in the room that reminds me a lot of several moments in in the show Mm -hmm. especially the floating there yeah totally um also i like in this issue that it's basically a david scheme what we've seen in the first three volumes of like the way that david you know i had a secret scheme all along some, they pulled a David scheme on him. Yeah, exactly. Right? He should have seen it coming. He's the victim of the exact kind of scheme that he has pulled through the whole run of this comic book. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah, me too. Me too. 
And then it turns out Arcus wasn't mad at him. Mm -hmm. He was just trying to teach David the exact same kind of lesson that David taught him. And he's glad that he was taught that lesson. Like, I like that too, because Arcus should be a hero, really. And his redemption is not, uh, hasn't really been successful if he's bitter about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. So issue 21, the cover is David standing on an eyeball of the floor. Yeah. Like the veins, the red veins in the eye look like hands reaching out for him. The relevance of this cover, I guess, is that Golden X is in Luca's body. So like Luca has eyeballs or basically what his body is. Yeah, they like float outside of his face. I don't, by the way, like that. (laughs) No, it's it's super gross. It's like it's well done. They do a good job. Technically, but like, I don't like that visual of eyeballs floating outside his face at all. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) This issue has, is by artist Koi Pham, presumably doing both uh, pencils and inks. So this issue is called Super Organic. The Golden Professor X battles with David Ruth visits David's mind to try to talk him down. Golden X calls himself David's son and then launches a nuke. Bum, bum, bum. Exactly. Like, this is what I said. Every issue ends with, like, a really bum, bombastic bum, bum. bomb. <laughs> um, so, do we... I said in uh, issue 19, I didn't like that we don't find out who Golden X is. Do we find out who Golden X is here? Is this our answer? He's David's son, I guess? He's his son in the sense of, like, like yeah. Zeus. He comes fully formed from David's head. Which basically just means he's another one of David's alternate personalities. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Who, so, man- who managed to somehow escape and get a body. Yeah. So it's a little anticlimactic. Yeah. You know, like, I kind of like, uh, in conception, th- what it means symbolically. I like that Golden X grew inside David. Yeah. Isn't an invader. Yeah. But it's also a little like, you've built it up as this great big mystery of who is he. And then, oh, he's who you probably thought he was all along. <laughs> right? I didn't really think it was a mystery. They I act like felt... it is, in this Did volume they... especially. Okay. Is that why this wasn't very good to me because I felt like it wasn't a mystery. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Like, it's a bit of a, like, I think for us as readers, it is less mysterious than Simon Spurrier thinks it is and less mysterious than David finds it. Right? Right. David doesn't know whether Golden X is actually Professor X or not, but we never really suspect that he is Professor X. Right, yeah. Right? And then when we learn for sure he's definitely not Professor X, then like, well, then what is he? But we never thought he was Professor X. So for us as readers, that's not like a revelation or a twist, really. But I think Simon Spurrier thinks it is. Yeah. And then it's played in this volume... There's three moments in issue 19, here in issue 21, and then like near the end, uh, issue 23, where David's going to destroy Golden X, who's back in his brain, and Golden X is like, but you never found out who I was. I'm like, yeah, but we didn't really care. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't think that you, Simon Spurrier, knew. Yeah, that is the trouble. Is right. I feel like, I just, I really struggled with this volume. Yeah. Really struggled with it, to be honest. And endings are really hard. Yep. I um, I agree. I think this volume, I think I liked it more than you did. But I think it's not as good as volume three, which was not as good as volume two, which was not as good as volume one, yeah. unfortunately. What do you think of David? rainbow look I kind of like it how about you I think artistically Mm -hmm. I think it's really cool 
I think it looks really neat. But, like, why, though? <laughs> why does he have, like, a weird rainbow squid head? Because it he's all the different the, all the personalities all together. I like the line that Ruth has of, One minute, I lost you and a bunch of memories, and now you have a squid instead of hair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... What he is inside his head is all uh, metaphorical representations of ideas. Yes, that's also true. So the avatar that we have of his main personality now looks like what it would look like if all his different personalities are inhabiting one body. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's a good call. I like the way it looks. I like it visually with all the colors in it. I like the way... I really like the panel with the two of them dancing. Yeah. Because she, he kind of, you know, it's up to their imagination. So she's in a fancy dress and he's in his rainbow hair going up. And it's just a really beautiful image. Mm-hmm. And I also, in this, I like the, speaking of pages, I like the page of David fighting Golden X, like, in several different, uh, on several different planes mm. in different panels yeah. that are all like shifting off the page. So it's him, his body fighting the great big wooden body. And then in the astral plane or whatever they call it in this book, fighting golden X and then in like a different astral plane. And then just on the a blank comic book page and all the panels are flipping. Like, I think it's a good looking page. There, there is some amazing, this, this is, this issue especially with the beautiful art. Mm-hmm. With, like, clearly, they spent a lot of time doing art. And this, is this the one with two artists credited? Um, two? No. Oh, no. This is the one with just one. Koi Fam dead, the pencils and ink. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is one artist. Great job. All through, uh, Koi Fam does plays with the layout more than Tanning Huat tends yeah. to. And I really like it. I really like that. I like it a lot, actually. I like any time a comic book plays with its panels in this way and makes it non-traditional panels. It really, it's the medium and the message together. Mm-hmm. So you, ha- so David's mind is very fractured, and so you'll have panels that represent that, and it makes for an interesting reading experience, and it makes for a very visual. It translates really well to the visual medium. And in the same way, the TV show uses the medium of television mm-hmm. in, like, fascinating shots and angles and whatnot, the comic book will tell its story by manipulating the panels in interesting ways. Yeah, for sure. Issue 22, the cover is all of David's altars in a line signing up to the United Ego Force Recruiting Station, like a military... Uh, recruiting station. I really, really like this yeah, cover too. I noticed just now, I didn't notice till now, but one of the thing, the kind of alters monsters in line is a like crab man wearing a Hawaiian shirt. And on his arm, there's like a scratched into his shell as a tattoo. Shelly. <laughs> and a <laughs> anchor. That's really funny because he's got a shell. That is really funny. The significance of this cover, again, not very hard to figure out. David is still uniting all his personalities into a coherent whole. The artist of this issue is Koi Fam. Once again, I assume that means both pencils and ink. Oh, sorry. So that sounded like it wasn't the end of a <laughs> thought, so you paused a long time, but it was the end of a thought. Pencils and ink. So issue 22 is called Antibodies. David calls on the X-Men to help stop the nuke. They battle, and David and Ruth are able to stop Golden X, banishing him into the cortex. But, in the end, the world worm is born from David. Whatever the crap that means. <laughs> I, okay. This is one of my favorite issues of the volume. Yeah. I think this one and issue 19 work pretty, work pretty well. Um, 
the way he get, he he gets to say to me my X Men. Oh, I is love it. Very brilliant. I love the X Men coming at all. Like yeah. you turn the page and all the X Men are coming. And even if you know it comes up a little bit in this volume, but if you know that like Cyclops and uh, Cyclops is off running his own team, and Wolverine is running the X Men right now, but Cyclops and Wolverine are both there. They've joined together to help David. Oh, they're buddies. I know. <laughs> and then when, he, yeah, he says to me, my X-Men is so great. I really love it. When I was reading it, I was like, Jan, Jan, have you got to this part yet? Yep. Uh, I had not. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't tell you what happened. It's one of my favorite moments in, in this volume, for sure. In this it, volume, in this issue, I do, something I'd like less, uh... Abigail Brand dies? Like the so- the green sword agent? Uh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, it's a little gratuitous in the sense, not like it's uh, super bloody, just in the sense of like, we have to prove the stakes are real by killing someone. It can't be someone important, but it has right, to be someone yeah. sort of important to us, like as in we've met them before. It just seemed like... Uh, checking a check mark off a list rather than anything that we cared much about. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It did not raise the stakes. Yeah. It was just like we killed off a character that we sort of cared about. Um, I really like the. There's a couple of really good lines of dialogue in this issue that I like quite a lot, and one of them is David saying, "Ah." Uh, We're not strong enough to defeat him unless we're together, but that's the secret. It's not about strength. That's the secret. That's the trick. It's about being complete. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a really great line. It really uh, encapsulates a major theme of this volume and of the whole run. It's not about strength. It's about being complete. It's a really good thought that's muddied by the action of what happens, that being, well, but... It's about being complete so that you can be strong, though. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It would be better if it wasn't that, but it's still a great line, I think. Yeah. And then when David uh, and the X-Men defeat Golden X and throw him back in the Cortex, and uh, he says, you never even found out what I am. And David says, I know what you are. You're a bad idea. That's very Legion season two. I know, right? Yeah. A lot of this volume has been about David fighting a bad idea Mm -hmm. that was born from somewhere inside his head and that maybe is compared to an egg. (laughs) Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think this is definitely the root of some of the ideas for season two. Yeah, absolutely. There's another line that I really like. Uh, as a line and that's uh, delivered by golden x inside david's head he says do you know what the best what's the best way to cure a sickness of the mind you don't you idiot you just find ways to live with it yeah that's a great moment and a great line but i do not like where they go next with it and again i feel like where the story goes next really undermines that Mm -hmm. moment if after that david had found a way to live with it and it continued to be hard i think that would be a much less uh you know less of a bang ending yeah it makes me think of the um, musical episode of buffy not quite the fireworks i was looking for yeah but uh I want an end. I think more satisfying would be an ending like the end of the musical episode where we didn't get the fireworks, but instead we got, he just learns to live with it. And that was the end. (laughs) And the next two, like, forget about the world worm that you've been seeding all along. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. I kind of almost expected this to be the ending. I was surprised when it had two more issues after this. Because that's a great moment to end on. Yeah. And like, he's defeated this guy that they've been... Yep. Yeah, had all along is defeated. So then, like, what's going to happen? But then, of course, you have to have David turn into the villain. So issue 23, the cover is a giant, monstrous David made out of his altars. Uh, he looks Frankenstein-y more than 
uh, Voltron y. Um, Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein's monster. What is Frankenstein's monster's last name? Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> um, the relevance of this, again, is not hard to figure out. He's a giant David made out of his altars. That's what is happening in this issue. Mm-hmm. The giant it's... David doesn't look like this, but it's a giant David made from uniting all of the personalities in David's head. He has like a belt with a 23 on it for the 23rd issue. <laughs> Pencils by Tan Ang Huat and Ink by Craig Young. So this is uh, issue 23, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. Good title, by the way. Mm-hmm. The world worm begins to destroy, and Ruth enters David's mind while their physical bodies do battle, because she is the one who must destroy him. David accesses his time power, and David and Ruth embrace, have sex, merge somehow at the very end. Yeah. I want to say just a little second, I said slouching toward Bethlehem is a good uh, title. That, if you don't know, is a reference to a poem by William Butler Yeats. It's a really good poem, and is about a monster. (laughs) A monster that represents uh, the evils of the 20th century. And it has, like, the last line of it is... uh, It's not the title of the poem. No. Uh, But the last line of it is... And what rough beast it's our come... It's our come by at last. I don't remember the participle. And what rough beast it's our come on at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. The second coming in the poem is not a coming of peace and goodness, but a come of a mon- coming of a monster that's going to destroy the world. And it's kind of uh, the Sphinx coming out of the desert of Egypt. Anyway, it's a good title for this because... Are you sure it's Yeats and not T.S. Eliot? Yes, this one's Yeats. This one's Yeats? Okay. Yeah. And it's a good title for this issue, particularly because David is, in a lot of ways, throughout the whole issue, like, he's very, in a mundane way, a guy with daddy issues who's trying to live under the shadow of his father, but also Charles Xavier is a godlike figure in X-Men, and he's the son of God, uh, and he's... second coming of Charles Xavier, but he's a monster instead of a savior. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of, uh, we expected the second coming to be good, but in Yates it's not. Mm -hmm. And here it's not. I just struggle to know what's going on. Like, he is floating above the earth, he is somehow destroying it. He's like sucking all mutants into himself and getting bigger. And Ruth is battling him, and, like, as she's battling him, she's also inside him. Right. That's a separate, like, their physical forms are, like, punching each other. Doing other things, yeah. And it doesn't really make... It has never really been clear, except that we are told that it is true, but it has never been clear why Ruth is the one who has to stop him. Like what power? She is not. Uh, She's not affected by affected his power? by his power for reasons. Yeah. She can now has the power of punching him she for beca- reasons. Well, she become at the end of the last issue. We didn't mention it because she be she be beca- she becomes destiny is her new name instead of blindfold. Instead of blindfold for reasons. A lot of what happens with the two of them is it was foretold, so now it's happening. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. unsatisfying. It really is. I don't like the moment when David, like, if there is there some idiot god controlling this, if so, I hate you looking at, like, okay, you're insulting the art, the writer of the comic book. It's been done. Yeah. <laughs> it's been done a lot better than this. It's, you know, I just don't think it's a cliche and he's not doing anything with it that hasn't been done a lot better by different people in other times, you yeah, know? exactly. And then, I really, I, I... It doesn't make sense. Like, what does it mean for David's personalities to be all united if he still can't control himself? Yeah. What is his body doing 
if it's not under the control of his mind? What does it mean for his identity to be like a coherent whole if he's still commenting on how he can't control it? Like, who's doing the commenting if not part of the coherent whole? And then if you're, if you're a coherent whole, why can't you just stop doing what you're doing? It doesn't make sense. But maybe because it's it's not a coherent whole. Yeah. He is still he thinks that he can somehow merge all of his personalities together, but they're still all separate. Right. And this is the disaster that happens when he tries to do that is he thinks he's in control, but he's not even noticing that he's commenting on his own lack of control. Maybe. Yeah. So maybe that's part of it. And he's still like when he realizes he can access the like time stop thing that he still has to access it in the old way he still says says i have your power yeah. instead of kind of realizing that it's his power yeah acting like it is yeah so he's just messed up yeah and i think what you said before about like you know he just decides to merge but like he didn't he just decided to not he like opened all the cages right and this is the rampage that happened and he's fooling himself he's by thinking that himself. he's merged his personality. Yeah, exactly. All he's done is open all the gauges. Hmm. Okay. Should I like it a little better? I still think this issue does not make a ton of sense. No, nope. no. Nope. And it's hard to understand on a literal level what's happening. Mm -hmm. That said, there are some great visuals in this uh, in this issue. Uh, so many, like, big splash pages still, mm -hmm. and, like, page, page 107 is, like, David and Ruth in the middle, and time stands still, and all the different things that are happening at this moment are kind of, like, broken glass shattered all around, and we yeah. have, you know, Cyclops on the ground, and Wolverine on the ground, and, uh, Captain Ruth, America. Captain America, and soldiers, and it's, it's a really, I think, striking page. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't like the end of, like, and then, as time is frozen, we do it. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think it's uh, kind of cliche and flat. Yeah. Issue 24. The cover of this issue is Blindfold Ruth shaving David's head. Uh, he's like in a barber chair. So that's not really David's face. That's Professor X. Well, is it? I guess. That's David's... not what his face looked like in previous Yeah, I covers. guess not. His, his face is re most recognizable by the hair, though. Like... I like this visual. I like this cover, too. Uh, it feels like, again, you say it looks like Professor X. Uh, the f way that he's drawn the face, sure, I think you're probably uh, right. It definitely is uh, suggesting Professor X because he's all bald. Yeah. Because, like, the hair is what makes him David. You shave off the hair, and what do you find underneath is Professor X. Yeah. And then in... Also, it's relevant that, like, to the issue because the hair represents David, so David unmakes himself in this mm. issue. Yeah. Blindfold defeats him, takes away his himness, but then also he symbolically becomes Charles. Like, he gains Charles's approval, recognizes that he has Charles's approval, and he symbolically becomes Charles in that he becomes, like, the kind of self sacrificing and uh, uh, morally righteous savior of mutant kind that he believes charles to be right getting a little bit ahead of ourselves so i still haven't described the issue yeah okay so go. is this last issue is called for we are many pencils by tan angwat ink by craig young all right david and ruth break apart and david prepares to die his body tearing itself apart Ruth delivers a message from Professor X saying, I'm proud of you. And David bends time to prevent his birth. But a part of him still lives on in Ruth's head. So the words that Ruth has been hearing all volume, like from the beginning of the first 
uh, for the beginning of issue 19, there's these speech balloons that Ruth hears and can't understand. And that yeah. becomes clear here that it was all along echoes of Professor X saying, I'm proud of you, son, as a message for David. Yeah. Okay. Sure, I guess. <laughs> Why does it matter that he's proud of him? Well, because a lot of what motivates David is this, uh, he's torn between wanting to get his father's approval and wanting to reject his father's approval. And that has always transparently been like the the wanting to not care about his father's approval has always pretty transparently been sour grapes. Yes. He thinks his father didn't want him because his father didn't want him. He thinks that makes him unworthy. And so this message from his father that his father's proud of him, like that's been what he's been chasing all along, really. Yeah. So I guess that's good. Yeah. I don't... Really, I don't. Not sure it really makes sense, though. No, sure doesn't. Because how is he, like, how does that work, though? <laughs> <laughs> he sent. He was. Is, is Professor X's mind alive? Like, how does it actually work? Is this a ghost? <laughs> it's a message sent through the time and space. Okay, can Professor X do that? Blindfold can, I guess. Blindfold can. And so she's retrieving this message from who knows. How I does don't, he... This is the thing is like endings. Boo. <laughs> I know. And this I'm is why this issue. I'm just going to say it out right. I don't like this ending. No. There's things I don't mind about this ending. But I'm picking on the details of this doesn't make sense. Because I feel like this whole volume, what's unsatisfying about it is that kind of thing. Is that like, this has not been Simon Spurrier's problem all along. Or maybe... It has been a temptation all along. And here he just goes with it. That like, eh. <laughs> right? Why though? Eh. There's things I like about this ending though. Or there's things I don't mind about this ending. I don't... The, the general like... He goes back in time and prevents his birth. I don't hate that. No, I don't hate that. And he lives on in her mind. That's fine. I guess. I guess. I like that less. The going back and preventing his birth, the Deus Ex Machina of it, the like, I'm going to uh, change the problem. I'm not going to either be defeated or defeat. I'm just going to make all this never have happened. I normally really don't like a story that says none of this really had any stakes and mattered. But I don't hate that. Yeah. I think it's less emotionally satisfying than if we'd ended with him unifying with Golden X and then struggling with it. I think that would have been a more satisfying ending. But I, I don't think that part is a terrible ending. I think a lot of this issue, though, where, like, he's unified with himself, but he still can't control what he does still throughout this issue. The moment when, like, I like... A lot. The moment where the weaver spider that has never unified with him comes down and the David who's been narrating to us all along and the weaver spider look at each other and they both think the other one is a split personality and they're the real David. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great moment. Yeah. And it's like what spl split personalities presumably are like, right? Yeah. You know, the split personalities aren't like, yeah, I'm the fake one, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know anyone with... Uh, Dissociative Actuals. identity disorder, and I'm not sure that this is or should be thought of as actually representing what dissociative identity disorder is like. But I do think in theory and conception, that's what it should be like. Absolutely. Right? I like how that uh, puts everything we've seen on shaky footing that like maybe our narrator never was the David in charge of David. Yeah. Yeah. He was just the narrator part. Yeah. He's the break the fourth wall and talk to the audience part. I kind of like that. That could be really cool. But it still doesn't really make sense. No. So in the end, do we think that our David from the TV show is going to end anything like this? Is there any chance that our David is going to unmake himself or end up an aspect of uh sid's brain because they Maybe. hang out in their own like inside of his head all the time just like ruth and david in this comic 
Maybe. Maybe that's where we're headed. I hope not. Yeah, me too. I think Noah Hawley is smarter than that. Yeah. But I do think that there's definitely an influence here. Yeah. That I am noticing all the threads in common between this and our TV show. I could see... I don't think I'd be happy with it. I don't think I would find it satisfying. But I also uh, admit the possibility that when they actually did it, they'd do it well enough that I'd like it. True. That's very true. But the like the he goes back in time and stops himself from existing. I didn't hate. I just didn't like in this. It wasn't necessary because what made it happen was that he couldn't control himself and that didn't make any sense. Yeah. So if you made that part make more sense, if you made it actually persuasive that like he actually can't live and there's no way to stop him, which uh, Simon Spurrier never sold me on that. Mm -hmm. If Noah Hawley sold me on that, then maybe I would not mind that same sort of ending where he goes back and undoes everything. For the good of the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I don't... And I don't think I would hate it if Noah Hawley did it as well as he does stuff. If, in the end, uh, Sid's the only one who remembers David ever existed. Yeah. Because that's a way of bringing all those things... Bring Like I said, what I don't like about it was all a dream is then there's no stakes. Yeah. But if... After David unmakes himself, Sid still remembers everything. Then there are stakes. Yeah. Then everything has changed the world and she carries forward the, you know, effect of everything. And that only one character needs to remember it for it to have mattered. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't hate that. I would kind of hope that that isn't what happens. But I wouldn't hate it. Yeah. How about you? I don't want any kind of ending that erases what already happened. Mm -hmm. That'll annoy me. Mm -hmm. But that being said, when I said, like, uh, David could end up in Sid's head the same way, coming up with that made me happy. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking of that makes me like, hmm, that could be really interesting. Yeah. Is there anything that you... uh... Anything from this volume, either that or anything else that you think might show up in season three of Legion? Any predictions or hopes or wishes for season three of Legion based on now reading? I still would like to see more of David's personalities in this way, in like the rooms in his head yeah, kind of a way. I would love it if... A eventually on legion it's like clockworks the mental hospital with every room a different aspect of david all played by dan stevens all played by dan stevens <laughs> yes that would be great yeah 100 <laughs> percent. all right yeah i think the message that golden x gives that I think this comic book doesn't really believe or doesn't act like it was meaningful, I would like to see the show take seriously. Yeah. Which is uh, the message of, you know, how you cure uh, sickness of the mind. You don't. You just find a way to live with it. Yeah. I would like this show to end with finding David finding a way to live with it, not being cured. Uh and still struggling, but finding a way to live with it. I think that's an uh, an emotionally satisfying ending. Agreed. So this is the end of our three bonus episodes that we've been promising for so long, talking about the uh, Legion comics. What is next for Clockworks? Good question. <laughs> what I, is next for Clockworks? I think we, without... Uh, committing to an order. I think we'll keep doing an episode every two weeks about something that's connected to Legion, just as we did last break. Mm -hmm. And I think some things we're really interested in talking about are Deadpool 2, 
The Gifted, we talked about the trailer for it and the first episode, but then we never came back to it. And yeah. maybe we could do an episode. I think we won't do an uh, episode by episode, but we could do one episode of our show for the whole first season of The Gifted. And we could also do one episode of our show for the whole first season of The Runaways. We've been well. We've been watching this show on Netflix called Maniac. Yeah, we haven't finished it yet. We haven't finished it yet, but it certainly has like some serious Legion vibes. And we've been talking about it on Twitter a bit. How like, hey, this is a lot like Legion. Like it's got yeah some similarities. So we might talk about that in a future episode in a little bonus. Yeah. Bit. So I think expect an episode of Clockworks talking about something that's connected in some way to Legion until such a time as Legion returns. We would be happy to talk to anyone who's involved in making Legion. If anyone involved in making Legion is listening to my voice right now, get in touch with us. And you can do that through Twitter, at ClockworksCast. You can do that by email, ClockworksCast at gmail.com. You can do contact us in both of those ways, even if you don't make Legion, which is Probably, let's be honest. A lot more likely. Much, much more likely. (laughs) If you like this show, please do all the things. Share it with people. Tell people about it. Rate it and review it and be nice to us. If you want us to keep making shows, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash ClockworksCast. That's what made these three episodes happen. And we have more things planned that we would love to do. Anything else we need to say at this point? Nope. That's it. Thanks for listening. I've been Paul Moffat. I've been Jan Moffat. Goodbye. This pencils by Tan Eng Huat and ink by Craig Young... That's this issue. You keep doing that. I keep doing that. I keep doing it like the drawer. Let me say it again.